I want to say thank you for your patience in my absence. Thank you to Nathan for preaching when I wasn't here and our staff. And those of you who have just jumped in and done extra, thank you for your grace. It's a privilege. I consider it a privilege to be the pastor here of such a, a wonderful church. And as I go throughout our community, it's what I hear over and over and over again is what a blessing our church is, not just when we gather here together, but when we scatter out into our community, our neighborhoods and jobs and schools, uh, we're a blessing there too. And so it is really a privilege to be a part of this church. I'm thankful to be your pastor. And I'm, I'm excited this week because we're beginning a new series. It's called This Is Us. And in this series, we're talking about who we are as a church. We're kind of laying out, here's some core values that we have. If you're going to be a part of Cross Community, you're going to see this. Um, if you're new here, you've come at a really good time because we get to kind of lay it out, right? This is who we are. And if you've been here for a while and you wonder, um, why we make some of the decisions that we do and why we do things in the manner that we, we do things. This series should lay that out for you. And so really excited to begin this series today. Now, a, a couple of years ago or several years ago, uh, went on vacation with my family and we went down to the beach in Alabama and, you know, we're from eastern Oklahoma, so we're like, hey, there's water, we should go fishing, you know, but uh, I'm from eastern Oklahoma and not the coast and so I don't know anything about uh, surf fishing, that sort of thing. And so we go to this um, kind of nasty little bait shop, you know, the kind where you feel like the guys actually know what they're talking about. And so we go in there and we're like, hey, would you help us? We want to catch fish uh, in the, the ocean. And so what does that look like? And those guys, they took us around and they showed us what bait we needed to buy, the little rigs that we needed, the weights, the hooks, everything that we needed to go and catch fish. And y'all, they didn't lie to us. Man, we, we rigged everything up just like they told us to. And we caught a ton of fish. We even caught some rays, which were huge and awesome. It's like trying to pull a kite through the water. You know, it was like, it was just a, an amazing time of fishing. And we thought, we're going to do this every year. Like, basically, we, we're experts now, right? We've done this once. We caught some fish. Let's go do it. And so went back the next year, and we took the same poles, the same line, uh, the same rigs that they taught us to, to use, the same baits and everything, except for um, that next year, we really didn't catch very many fish at all. As a matter of fact, when we would throw our lines out into the surf, uh, the current was so strong that they would just get swept down the beach and then end up in really shallow water, and we couldn't catch anything. And in the midst of that, we learned a pretty important lesson. The stronger the current, the heavier the weight that you need. And luckily in that fishing trip, we were able to get some more and bigger weights and able to catch a few fish. But I believe that that principle is true for us in life as well. The, the stronger the current, whether it's, it's your life or a ship, or the stronger the current, the heavier the anchor that you need. And so when we think about us as a church in the culture in which we live, there was a day, even when I was younger, a day in which our culture largely affirmed Christian values, where our culture would say, hey, the Bible is something that's important. We should live by that. Right is right and wrong is wrong. But we now live in a culture, and parents, let me you know, say this to you especially, your kids are being raised in a culture that is dramatically different from what you were raised in. And as a result, if we are going to remain tethered to God, hang on to the faith of the scriptures, uh, the faith is, which is handed down to us from prior generations going all the way back to Adam, um, we need a strong and a heavy anchor. And so the first value that we're going to talk about in this series is that we as a church, we are going to be unapologetically biblical when we preach and when we teach the things that we believe and the things that we're going to do, the way that we're going to choose to handle conflict, the way that we're going to structure our leadership, we are going to be unapologetically biblical. Now, most every church is like, well, yeah, yeah, we're, we're biblical. The, the trouble comes is there's this temptation today, and many churches have already succumbed to it, to say, well, we're biblical until it intersects with culture in a way that kind of puts us and casts us into a negative light, right? We're faithful to the word as long as it doesn't cost us anything. And then slowly but surely, churches begin to compromise those difficult teachings of Scripture, those passages that it's easier for a preacher to skip. And slowly, little by little, we begin to compromise the Word of God in favor of remaining popular and acceptable in our culture. Well, at Cross Community Church, we are going to be unapologetically biblical. Uh, to be honest with you, if you show up here every week and you never walk away feeling convicted. 
You never feel like your toes have been stepped on. You're never challenged. We are probably not preaching the word because we are our sinful men and women. We don't always get it right. As a matter of fact, in my own life, Scripture continues to confront me in my ways of thinking, some of the beliefs that I would hold. And it's my job is to submit myself to the word of God. That's what we're going to do as a church. So what does it look like to be unapologetically biblical? Uh, The first thing that I want you to see is that we are going to stand on God's word. Rather than picking and choosing the parts of the Bible that fit us, uh, essentially uh, making Scripture in our image, uh, we're going to allow Scripture instead to shape us. Rather than saying, you know what, I like this part and that part. Um, I I trust God here, but I don't think he really has it all together there. Rather than being, uh, rather than trying to erect a God in our own image, we instead were reminded that we were made in his. And we were made to reflect God and his glory to a world that desperately needs to see what is true and what is real and what is right. And so as we preach and as we teach and as we live our lives, we will look back to, we will stand on the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is the Apostle Paul writing to his young protege, Timothy. And this is what he says in verse 16. He says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Now, there's two really important words that we need to look at there as we begin in this text. The first two words that he he writes there are all Scripture. The parts that hit us just the right way, that we would nod our head with in agreement, that we're like, yes, that will preach, right? Those parts of Scripture, and then the parts that confront us. The the parts that as we're reading, they stop us in our tracks and they make us consider uh, the parts that resonate with us and the parts that really don't. All Scripture is God-breathed. That includes all of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament. Now, there, there is a, a bit of a movement, a tendency to want to diminish the Old Testament. Uh, if you've read much of the Old Testament, some people would say, man, it seems to present a God who, who's a little bit harsh, who, who does things that I'm not sure why he would do those things. You know, why would God allow Cain to kill Abel? Why would he cause the Israelites to wander in the wilderness for 40 years? Why would God allow his son to suffer and bleed and die on a cross, why wouldn't God do something differently? We believe that all Scripture is breathed out by God, the Old Testament and the New, and we can trust them. Now, if you're questioning the Old Testament and its relevance, uh, but you believe the New Testament, I would want to point out for you that Jesus and the New Testament authors quoted from the Old Testament over 295 times. They believed it was Scripture. They quoted it as such, and so should we. And maybe you're one of those Christians or one of those people who's tempted. Uh, You've heard the argument, you know, I don't know how I feel about the New Testament. I'm okay with the Old, but, you know, I really just like to read the New Testament and especially the the words of Jesus, the red letter words. Maybe I'm just going to, I don't really love Paul. You know, he's a little bit strong, seems, you know, maybe too convictional. I really like the words of Jesus. Well, again, the New Testament authors as they were pinning the words of Scripture, um, they were doing so with the understanding that they, just like the Old Testament prophets, just like Moses in the Old Testament, they knew they were writing the very words of Scripture. Here's what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14. We saw this in our last series, beginning in verse 37. He said, If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things that I am writing to you are a command from the Lord. Paul's like, listen, I'm not writing a letter for fun here. I'm not just, you know, writing down some helpful suggestions. I am writing to you commands from the Lord. All Scripture, the Old Testament and the New, the parts that we love and embrace, the stories that we want to tell our kids, and the stories that we're like, I'm not sure I'm ready for you to hear that just yet. All Scripture is God. Breathe the triumphant victories for the nation of Israel, 
and the times where God's people endured great seasons of suffering. All Scripture is God-breathed. Now, I want to look at those next two words because they're the most important in this entire text. They're the reason that we will be unapologetically biblical, that we will stand on the Word of God, even as things in culture shift and they change. It's those next two words that, that make all of the difference for us. The word God breathed in the Greek, this is theonoustos, means to be breathed out. It means that what we have in Scripture, the words that we have here written in the Bible, were breathed out by God himself. And because God is perfect in all of his ways, he's God, right? If, if he were imperfect, he would cease to be God. But because God is perfect in all of his ways, every one of his words are perfect. And because they're the words of God and because they're perfect, we can trust them. We can stand on those words. When the, the currents of culture are, are shifting, when things are moving, ideas are, are being presented, we can stand firm upon the word of God knowing they came from an unchanging, perfect God who never makes a mistake. God is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-good. So we can entrust our lives to him. God is love, which means that he wants what's best for us even more than we want it for ourselves. The older my kids get, the more that we have conversations with them um, where they don't understand where we're coming from. And we love them so much and we want their lives to go well. We want them to make wise choices. Uh, but they're getting old enough, and they think for themselves, and they don't always see the bigger picture. And so we plead with them, hey, would you just trust us? Like, I, I know you're not going to feel this at this moment. Like, I've been there. But if you'll just trust us, and I believe we have the same thing in the Word of God. Oftentimes, we live our lives, and we see circumstances and situations. We think we know a better way forward. And yet God has given us His perfect Word. And the invitation is just to trust our good and perfect and loving Father, understanding that He knows infinitely more than we do. God is perfectly just, so all of our meager attempts at justice pale in comparison to His justice. God is infinite and unchanging. He's holy and true. In a world that is more and more confused, we can look to, go to God to know what is true and what is right and what is good, what is moral. We can look to the scriptures to know those things. The Bible is God's revelation of himself to the world. Now, I don't know about you, um, but I've heard this idea many times that God is uh, hes kind of distant and he's an uncaring God. That what he did was he created the world, universe, he set everything in motion, but now he's just kind of a loop, you know, hanging out at the other end of the universe. Uh, and he really doesn't care all that much about what's going on in our lives. And that couldn't be further from the truth. The scriptures tell us that God knit us together in our mother's wombs that we were fearfully and wonderfully made, that he knows our whole frame. He knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows our name. He knows our deepest desires and our greatest hurts, and that God sees those things, and he loves us, and he's inclined to work on our behalf. And that same God who knows us and cares for us through his word he has made himself known. He doesn't just want to know us. He wants us to know him. If you want to know the heart of God, of your heavenly father, he has revealed it to you through his word. And so we look to the word to know who God is, that we may know him. Now, there's something going on that you need to know about. And this thing has been going on since the beginning of time. We have an enemy, the devil, the deceiver. And he has been doing in our culture and every culture since what he did to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And it's trying to undermine God's word. Do you remember the first words that he said to Eve there in the garden? He approaches Eve. He's in the form of a serpent. He says, hey, Eve, did God really say that you shouldn't eat from any tree in the garden and, of course, we know that's not what God said. He's already distorting. He's trying to cast doubt on the nature and character of God. Did God really say, Eve? And listen, 
that's the question that he will whisper in your ear. That's the question that you're going to hear repeated over and over and over as you engage with culture. Does God's word really say? And for us as believers in Jesus Christ, the answer is yes. And not only do we believe that God says it, we will stand upon the word of God. If you're ever confused about what the will of God is, about what he desires for you, about who he is, or about who you are, you can look back to the word of God to have that clarified for you. In John 10.10, Jesus lays this out. He talks about our enemy. He calls him the thief. And he says, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Um, You need to know that following that question, the intent of our enemy causing us to question God's word is that he might bring about destruction in our lives. Did God really say that this is how you should express your sexuality? Did God really say that I shouldn't sleep with my boyfriend or girlfriend or the person who isn't my spouse? Did God really say that this is how you should handle your money? And the answer is yes, we look to the word because the enemy is here to still kill and destroy. But God sent his son Jesus Christ that we wouldn't have to live out the effects of sin, that generation after generation wouldn't suffer under the effects of sin, but that instead we might enjoy the abundant life that is available to us in Christ Jesus alone. The cross of Jesus Christ is an eternal reminder of God's overwhelming and even reckless love toward men and women. Now, if you haven't been here very long, you may not have heard my whole story. But if ever someone were writing an essay on Christian privilege, uh, I might be the poster boy for that. I mean, if they were just going to jot down, like, the, the guy that had every chance to get it right in his life, it would probably be me. And I had godly grandparents that loved me, godly parents who spent a tremendous amount of time in the Word and on their knees in prayer for me. I was raised up in this church And it would take me forever to talk about all the men and women who invested in my life and taught me the word of God. Like, listen, I had every chance to get it right. And yet I was still prideful and arrogant and self-reliant. I was pretty proud of how good I was. Until... The glass house of my own goodness came shattering all around me. And if you were reading a book about my life, this is the part where you would probably want to celebrate a little bit as the arrogant villain got what he deserved. But you know, in the midst of my greatest mess, my most profound failure in my life, God didn't give me what I deserved. But instead, he met me right there in the middle of my mess. His presence with me was palpable. He cared for me there. I remember just praying and reading through the Psalms and finding comfort of a God who cares, a God who protects, a God who restores, a God who forgives, a God who leads us when we don't know the way. God is not distant and uncaring. He loves us and he desires to lead us in a relationship with him. God was merciful in not giving me what I deserved. He was gracious in giving me love and and grace and forgiveness that I did not deserve. And God wants to do the same in your life. I don't know where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ, but I just want to encourage you today to begin to walk with God in his word every single day. Make it a part of your life. Make it a point devoting yourself daily to him in his word that he might lead you through those mountaintop times where we all want to stay up there, right? And through the deepest valleys of your life, God is with you and he wants to lead you. My life is a story no longer about my work and my own goodness, But it's a story about God's work and about his goodness to me. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, it says that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. 
We are unapologetically biblical. That means that we stand upon God's word. The scriptures, from the first page to the last, from the Old Testament to the New, are breathed out by God so that we can know him who loves us and who is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. But let me be very careful here. We are unapologetically biblical. We stand on God's word. But God's word should not be the soapbox that we climb up on and, and, and look down on other people. We don't just stand on God's word. We are to live God's word. And we do that in the trenches of our day-to-day lives. So number one, we stand on God's word. Number two, we live God's word in our lives. We strive to do that as a church We strive to practice that. When we have disagreements here, when we have conflict, we strive to live out Matthew chapter 18. We're going to go to our brother or sister, and we're going to have a conversation. We're going to show them their faults and hope to be reconciled. In the way that we conduct everything that we do here, we strive to live out God's word. And I want to encourage you to do the same thing with your lives. And here's why. Look what Paul says in 3.16 again. All Scripture is breathed out by God and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be equipped for every good work. Now, this word profit, it's kind of an interesting one. Uh, When I said it, it might have made your ears perk up. And for those of us as Americans here, we're hearing that word. um, If that profit was financial in nature... I believe that most every person you and I know would be devouring the Word of God. If reading and living the Word of God would lie in our pockets and enrich us financially, I believe that our devotion to God would make the Pharisees look like slouches, right? As Americans, we are so enamored with money that we would do almost anything to get it. And yet, the prophet that Paul talks about here. It's not necessarily financial in nature. It is something so much greater. The profit that we have here isn't financial, like just a little bit of money, which we can't trust in any way. It's not temporary, uh, meaning it's it's here today and gone tomorrow. The profit that he talks about here is eternal in nature. It lasts forever, and it truly enriches our souls. God's Word, it teaches and corrects us and trains us so that we may be mature and complete, equipped for every good work. Now, if you're a parent in the room, uh, you're probably a better parent than I am. I don't know what it is about me. Um, some parents, like, when their kids find something they enjoy, they're like, man, I just want to man, I just want to encourage them in that. And you're like shelling out the dollars, you know, so they can just do those things that they enjoy. Um, and, and for me, one of the things my kids enjoy is to play online games, and, and there's nothing wrong with online games. You know, they play Minecraft or Roblox or Fortnite or whatever. I really don't mind. Like, hey, go play a game. Everybody has their thing. The trouble is what I know about those games and their creators, that at some point, a group of people sat in the room and thought, how are we going to make a lot of money off of the kids that play these games? And so they have these, these systems in place that, that tempt my kids to want to spend a lot of money, their hard-earned money, um, in order to change their character on the game, right? They got different colored clothes now. Or maybe to give them some sort of an advantage. And my kids, because they love the game, um, they just want to keep shelling out money like right and left in order to be a better online gamer. And the thing that I just want to tell them is like, hey, that's not real. Like somebody sat at a desk and wrote code into a computer that makes your clothes a different color. Like you're getting nothing real in return for what you're investing. And that's what the Word of God does for us in this world. It helps us see through the mirage that culture frequently paints for us. It helps us see through the temptation that the enemy puts in front of us. The Word of God says, hey, don't invest your life into something that produces nothing in return. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, 
And all these things will be added to you as we stand upon and live out the word of God. We are enriched for us. We trade those things, those empty idols, which give nothing back in return for what is profitable in our lives. The things that shape us and give us true joy, true peace. We can walk in true love rather than a cheap substitute for those things. The Word teaches us. God has given us His Word as a good father would. It teaches us how to live. It warns us against settling for lesser things, the empty idols of our lives. Our culture right now would say what you need to pursue, especially you ladies because you're the only ones that really have a hope of achieving it, go pursue beauty. If you were just a little more beautiful, and if you could just get that hair just right, those clothes, that may, if you could just be a little more beautiful, then you would feel full and satisfied. Then people would look at you and they would want to be like you. You would be desirable to others. If you could just have a little more beauty, then your life would be all sufficient. And yet the Word would tell us that beauty is fleeting. And that's a race you're going to run the rest of your life and you're never going to reach the finish line. And maybe if you're a man here, maybe for you it's money or power. If you just had a little more money, you could better control things. And people would look up to you. It would open doors for you. You could fix all the problems in your life. If you were just a little more powerful or capable, then you would be satisfied. And yet the Word of God reminds us that we're not promised tomorrow. But instead that God holds the whole world in his hands and that God has placed us in the situation that we're in. The amount of money that we have, the amount of influence you might have, whether you have followers or you don't, like God has placed you right where he wants you in order that you might reflect his glory in the circle that you're walking in. It is the word which defines our reality and keeps us from investing our lives in the things that produce nothing else in return. It is profitable for us. And so we stand on the Word of God, and we live it out in our lives. Men, I want to challenge you in your home to ask the question, Men, are we living in obedience to the Word of God? And is the Word informing the decisions we make, the priorities that we're setting for our family? Are we living it out or are we just hearing it with our ears? There's, there's a warning in Matthew chapter 7, um, beginning in verse 21. This is the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' is his inaugural sermon as he begins his earthly ministry. And there's a really heavy, sobering warning for us. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, that's the one who gets to enter. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And in that text, in those very words of Jesus, there is this profound warning for us, and I want to give it to you and plead with you to consider, do you really know Jesus? It's a warning that some of us would amen the words of a good biblical sermon. We would agree with orthodox Christian doctrine. We might be able to recite some verses, articulate theological ideas. We might serve the church in various ways, but we don't actually know God. What we have is not a relationship with God. It's just religion masquerading as that. And we might be able to, you know, open up our spiritual resume and be like, hey God, look at all the things that I've done. But we don't actually know him. And Jesus says, do you know who's going to enter the kingdom of heaven? It's not the one who just hears my word or does a lot of good spiritual activities. It's the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He continues on in verse 24, and he says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. 
the one that lives these words out in their life, the one who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine but does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and that house, it fell with a great crash. The word of God, not just when it's heard, but when it's lived, it's a firm foundation for our lives. Does the word of God inform how you live your life? Does it inform your financial decisions? Does it inform the way that you prioritize your time? Does it inform the way that you would practice your sexuality? Are you striving to honor God in your life, or are you just doing what feels good to you? Jesus is like, if you're just kind of going with what you want to do, you should be really, really careful to live out the Word of God in your life. Now, the final thing here, we stand on the Word of God, we live the Word of God, and the final piece to this is that we should spread the Word of God. If we have found something that is truly profitable for us, if we have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and he did so not merely to save us from eternity in a place called hell, but that we might enjoy the abundant life in the here and now that will continue on into eternity, we should probably share that. Look what he says here in first, or 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. You see, these profitable words of the Bible... They're not just for us. As a matter of fact, there are men and women that you're rubbing shoulders with every single day who desperately need the word. They need to hear that there's a God who loves them. They need to hear that they don't have to be good enough in order to be loved by God or accepted by Him. They need to hear the message of the gospel, that in the midst of their sin, Jesus saw them. He knew their name. He, knowing all of their sin, He chose to die for them, that they might have abundant and true life in Him. So Paul tells Timothy, and we should hear the words directed to us, that we should be ready to preach the word. Now, if you're like, hey, not a preacher, you know, not my strength. Don't like to speak in front of people. Uh, the good news is preach isn't necessarily contained to what I'm doing here from the stage today. Um, preach means to openly proclaim something that has been done. It's just telling the story of what Jesus has done for you and what he desires to do for them. It's relaying the word of God to people who don't yet know Jesus Christ. And we have been called to that. That's who we are as the church. We are the hope of the world. We've been given the great commission to go and make disciples of all the nations. And certainly that involves people that we've never met in places that we've never been. But it also involves the people that we rub shoulders with every single day. The people that we know and that we love. We should be eager to share with them. Now, this message to be ready in season and out of season. The thing is, is what he's telling us to do is prepare ahead of time. And we don't know what's going to come. We don't know like who we're going to cross paths with, but we are told that we need to be ready. So what that looks like for us is we prepare in prayer. And we wake up in the morning, God, I want to deny myself and take up my cross and follow you today. My day isn't about me making a bunch of money and getting the next promotion. My day is about serving you. It's about making you known to the world. And so we prepare for that in prayer. We're praying for our lost friends and neighbors and asking God to do what only he can do in their hearts. But there's another component of this. It's not merely external that we would preach the word. We should also do that to those who are within the church. Look what he says here. He says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching that we also speak the word to one another. Listen, if you've been here very long, um, 
you consider this your church home, can I just give you a very strong encouragement today to become a member of this local body? And what that means is that you openly choose and you invite others to speak the truth of God's word into your life. That you would humbly acknowledge that you don't see everything just perfectly, that you don't get it all right all the time, and that you may need others to help you better understand how to follow Jesus. When we join a local church, we're saying to others, and I would invite this from you to me as well, man, if you see something in my life that is not honoring to God, that is not lining up biblically with what the Word teaches, I need you to come to me and show me that. As believers, we invite one another to speak into our lives. Our goal is to pursue Jesus. It's not to protect our pride, right? It's not to, to, to raise up this false illusion that we have it all together. It's to follow Jesus faithfully. Now, just to, to, to be clear here, and, and Paul was clear with Timothy, we don't do this with arrogance, and we're not going to beat people up with this. He tells us how we should do it. He says, with complete patience and teaching. And it's not, hey, look at me, I'm so much better, so I'm going to look down on you and, you know, bark out orders. It's that of a teacher. Hey, let me show you what it looks like to be a godly husband. Let me show you what it looks like to be faithful to God with your sexuality. It's with patience. This takes time. We as a church, we're going to be unapologetically biblical. We are going to stand on the Word of God. We are going to live out the Word of God, and we are going to share the Word of God. Now, here in just a moment, I'm going to pray. The band's going to come up. They're going to lead us in a song. And I want to invite you, uh, as we sing that song, to consider just three questions for you. The first is this. Do you know the God of the Bible? If you were to stand before God in just a moment, you find yourself there before God, are you confident that he would say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my glory? Or are you the person that might hear, you know what, you went to church, served, you learned some verses, you did some things. You might have prophesied, you might have cast out a demon. Depart from me because I never knew you. The question I want you to wrestle with is, do you truly know God? Have you invited him to be the Lord and Savior of your life and surrendered yourself to him? If you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm going to be up here right after the service is over, and I would love to visit with you more about what that looks like to follow Jesus. The second question I want to invite you to ask is, how are you doing at standing on and living out the Word of God? Are you compromising things that you know to be true in the Word? Maybe you're following your political party more than you are the Scriptures. And if you are, you should repent. Your political party can never save you, but the Word of God can. Jesus himself died on the cross to save you. Maybe it's just pressure from your peers. And rather than standing on and living out the Word of God, you've been compromising. Man, today, Jesus wants you to know he died for that too. And it's the time to repent and just walk in obedience to him. The final question I want to ask you today is, who in your life needs to hear the word? Who is that person in your life that you see, man, maybe their life's a train wreck. Maybe you see them just going off the rails a little. Maybe they don't need Jesus at all. But during this time, would you just consider, who in my life needs to hear? And then in this time, you're praying for them. You're praying for boldness that you might be faithful as a witness to them. Would you bow with me? Father, we do pray that we would be a church that is unapologetically biblical. And we do so because of your goodness and your glory. Because you are perfect, we can trust you. God, would you help us to swim against the currents of culture? To be faithful to you even when it gets difficult, even when it's costly to us. God, we're thankful for Jesus, that you saved us in the midst of our sin, that you love us even though we didn't deserve love. You've extended your grace and forgiveness to us. God, we praise you. We thank you for that. And we pray that we might live fully uh, and abundantly lives that are fully surrendered to you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand with me?